first shall be last and the last shall be first. This uh, is a bit of a counterintuitive phrase, uh, and it occurs several times in the, the Bible, in the Gospels, in reference to the future kingdom. Um, in this class, I'm hoping we'll be able to consider what it might mean, uh, look at a few examples of the principle that seems to be behind it, and we'll draw out a lesson or two for our lives today. So, yeah, the phrase, um, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, or sometimes the other way around, the last shall be first and the first shall be last, or just half of the phrase, the first shall be last, occurs twice in Matthew chapters 19 and 20, which was our reading, uh, once in Mark chapter 10, once in Luke chapter 13. And the Matthew 19 and Mark 10 occurrences are very similar. Uh, they're both the accounts of the rich young man's interaction with Jesus and an ensuing discussion between Jesus and his disciples. While the Matthew 20 record follows this on into a parable about workers in the vineyard where the Mark 1 doesn't. The Luke record is a bit different. Uh, and in the Luke record, it's an unnamed person, which we can presume is a disciple, uh, but they're not named quite the same way as in the other records. And in the Luke record, they ask Jesus for clarification about how many people will be saved. And the account of a rich man asking what he needs to do to inherit eternal life is removed to a few chapters later. The context of the phrase, as we've read, is the disciples asking how they'll be compensated for their efforts and the sacrifices that they've made in following Jesus, leaving their families, their property, in many cases also their work and thus their incomes, and or arguing about themselves, uh, among themselves about who will have the most important position in the future kingdom. Jesus tells them, yes, they will be rewarded, and many times over, but he gives them this warning, the first will be last and the last will be first. So what does it actually mean? To figure out what it means, we, I, we can compare the Luke record uh, that I mentioned, talk, which talks about people taking seats at a banquet table in the kingdom to another passage, Luke 14 verses 7 to 11, in which Jesus is visiting an important Pharisee, and he sees that people are trying to make sure they get to sit in the best seats at the table, and so he tells a parable. So if I can get a volunteer to read Luke 14, verse 7 to 14. So he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honourable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you ha will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he also said to him who invited him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbours, lest they also, they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Thank you. So uh, what? we're getting here is the lesson that putting effort into trying to achieve a position of importance is somehow counterproductive. Uh, in fact, intentionally doing the opposite of making yourself humble is somehow even more productive to achieving the goal of making yourself uh, a position of importance than working towards being important now. And this idea is at face value quite weird. It's like planning to drive to, from Sydney to Queensland for a holiday, but instead you head down to Canberra to stay the night and then keep going south. How's that going to get you to Queensland? From what I, from what I can tell, 
uh, it seems like the lesson Jesus is trying to teach is that really it's something that we shouldn't worry or argue about. Humans are very prone to concerns about their status, and as believers looking forward to and thinking about the kingdom a lot, it's very natural to also think that what it might think about what it might look like and think about what work will need to be done, who might therefore be given particular jobs, what jobs would seem to be particular important, and then also the ones we'd like to do ourselves. Often the 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 last two overlap. And it's also natural to want to do something or to be someone important. We can see that from the people around us. Uh, important people in today's society are put on a pedestal. Uh, they're frequently also materially wealthy, or their importance comes from them having wealth in the first place. People want to know their opinions, what they're doing. They can influence a lot of people because of this people wanting to know what they, they're doing. And they may own businesses. Their decisions affect hundreds of employees, and some of them might be in the position that they can't do anything about that. But being concerned about our own personal importance really isn't something that a disciple of Jesus should focus on. In fact, it's, it's a form of pride, which we are told is not of God, and therefore something we should be trying to avoid. Let's uh, consider the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke 18. Also, he spoke this parable to some who two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing far off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure you will have noticed that while the wording here isn't the first shall be last, there's a, a very similar saying here. We're getting the same message. Uh, Christ is telling us that rather than believing ourselves to be righteous and looking down on people who we think aren't righteous, we should be aiming, aiming for personal humility. And what does this look like then? Well, another time the disciples argued about who was most important is recorded in Matthew 18, verse 1 to 5. Or if you've moved to one of the other Gospels, then it's also in Luke 9, 46 to 48, and Matthew um, and Mark 33 uh, to 37. I might do this one. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and, and become as little children, you will, be, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. So we're given the description that we should somehow be receiving the kingdom of God as a little child. What does that mean? Uh, you may have heard someone say in the past that we ought to have a childlike faith. And I would ask, does that perhaps mean we need only take the most minimal understanding of the gospel, like a child might have, and keep things simple and easy by avoiding complicated topics? But I don't think so. Uh, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 4, verse 11 to, 40, to 15. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the angelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attend to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature ma manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in de deceit schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is, 
who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with with which is it is equipped when every part is working properly, making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Thank you. So uh, Paul wants the Ephesians to have a solid foundation in their understanding of what's true and not true, to be able to resist pressure from people and other things around them, and to work together to create and maintain a functioning group of fellow believers. That's not to say there's never a good reason for change, but like the Bereans of Acts 19, uh, 17, we should be checking our beliefs against the scripture and retaining only those that have evidence to support them. And we should also be careful that we don't become complacent in thinking we have all the answers. We can't allow ourselves to think that we have monopoly on truth or look down on others for being outside our exclusive club. Uh, John the Baptist criticized the Pharisees and Sadducees for doing exactly this in Matthew 3. I'll, I'll grab that one. Matthew 3, verse 5 to 12. So then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to John the Baptist and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Rood of vipers! who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Uh, so while it remains true that the Jewish ruling class were descended from Abram in a physical sense, the association with being descended from Abraham that had the association of real godliness and righteousness that was unfortunately long gone and the refusal to accept even the possibility that they could be wrong in their preconceptions about the promised messiah was uh, a major contributor in to the events that led up to them committing actual murder to maintain their political power and i think this is quite a strong cautionary tale we need to take this to heart that we shouldn't let our traditions and our preconceptions about our own righteousness get in the way of effective operation as disciples and as a body of Christ. But going back then to the idea of receiving the kingdom like a child, what we're being told is that we should be focusing on Christ rather than our self-image or our external image, how others see us. We should be able to receive Christ's teaching without our ego getting in the way. And like a child trusts their parents to look after them and to keep them safe, we should trust that God is looking after us. Though he can't promise to, that we won't have difficulties in our lives, and they might even be terrible difficulties and tragedies, the, in the end, it will work out. Uh, in the wise words of a fridge magnet that I remember seeing at my grandparents' house one time, God doesn't promise us a smooth flight, but he does promise a safe landing. So while running a race... You want to aim straight at the finishing line. You, you don't look down at your feet and you don't look around to see where everyone else is. And likewise, God wants us to focus on trusting him and keeping his commandments, not on ourselves, on others, or on how others see us. And the life of Christ epitomizes this principle of humility. In Philippians 2, I'll just paraphrase the RSV here, we read that though Jesus was in the form of God in that he perfectly reflects God's character, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped for, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and humbled himself and became obedient even unto death on a cross. Jesus could reasonably have expected to be treated like royalty because, in a sense, that's exactly what he was. But instead, he chose to take on the role considered the least important in society, that of a servant or slave, and to do everything that his father asked of him. He was able to put his own wants and desires second, even to the point of allowing those corrupt rulers to kill him, the only person ever who never actually deserved to die, because he knew that that was what God wanted him to do. When he washed the disciples' feet at the Last Supper, he told them that because he put us, had put aside his own self-importance to be able to serve them, they should do the same for each other, and we should likewise be willing to put aside our own ego so that we can help and serve our fellow believers. We also can't think of humbling ourselves as a backward way to being important again, where we can be humble and we do our acts of service 
and then think ourselves righteous or worse, parade around telling everyone how good we are either, because really that's just being proud again. True humility is where your focus is on something other than yourself. Acting so selfishly, uh, so selflessly, sorry, is something that uh, doesn't come naturally to us, but God has shown us that that's what he wants us to do. God's ways are often counterintuitive to our own. So another example, uh, the story of Gideon. In the book of Judges, we have another example of God making a choice that initially appears a bit strange. And we first meet Gideon in chapter 6, starting at verse 11. If I could have a volunteer to read Judges 6, verse 11 to 16. Now the angel of Yahweh came and sat under the terimus um, tree, which was in Ogbra, which belonged to Joash, the Abazarite. While his son Gideon pressed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites, and the angel of Yahweh appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with me, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all these miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not Yahweh bring us up from Egypt? But now Yahweh has... Uh, forsaken us and delivered us uh, into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this uh, might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not said, sent, sent you? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house. And Yahweh said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Thank you. So I, I, I kind of read this as a little bit uh, humorous. So Gideon's hiding in a hole in the ground, and he's threshing his wheat so the Midianites won't come and steal it. And this angel appears, and uh, he looks down on him, and he says, God's with you, you mighty man of valor. Uh, and I think it's understandable that Gideon's not really convinced uh, in, by this. As as we read, he's he's the least important and possibly the physically weakest guy in his family, if I interpreted the, the words correctly there. And his family is also the weakest family in the tribe of Manasseh. Why him? How can he be the one with the ability to do something about the invaders? Uh, and obviously that's because God is with him. The angel ends up giving Gideon a miraculous sign to help convince him, and throughout the process of Gideon collecting an army to go up against the Midianites, God gives him more signs as well to show that, yes, he is serious about Gideon being the one to deliver the nation. And clearly, self-confidence wasn't something Gideon had a lot of at the start, and yet, because he's willing to give it a go, uh, God is patient and willing to provide him with encouragement and to work with him. So about 30,000 people from Israel show up to help out. In comparison, the opposing army is, be, is described as numerous as locusts, and they're camels without number, but God isn't happy with the situation. Apparently, the Israelite army is too big. We'll continue from Judges 7, verse 1 to 7, and I'll grab that one. Then Gideon and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Harod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has, has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be at that of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, This one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself, likewise everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. 
And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men, but all the rest of the people who got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you, and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. If it were even remotely plausible that Gideon's army, which was already smaller than the Midianites' army, might actually win, the people might have claimed they won by their own strength rather than through the will and the power of God. There's two-thirds of the army sent home stra straight off the bat, and there's 10,000 left. And then there's this test where the method of drinking water is how they're divided to see who, who would stay and who would go. And I've read a number of different possible explanations of what the point of this was. One possibility is that it was just an arbitrary decision based on the behavior of the people, basically just picking at random to get the numbers down. It's not very satisfying. Uh, another is that the people drinking with their head down to the water were choosing to satisfy their own thirst over keeping alert and watching for enemies, and therefore they weren't morally suitable for doing the task at hand. And another is that the people who drank with their hands were alert and watching for enemies because they were afraid, but they had decided to come anyway, so they were chosen because they were afraid but trusted in God, while the others were overconfident. Uh, I don't necessarily find any of those explanations to be completely satisfying uh, by themselves, but the main theme seems to be that drinking uh, with hand shows greater readiness for action, and regardless of the reason for why that is, the readiness for action made them suitable. So with only 300 people, which is about 1% of his original force, uh, Gideon gets another dose of encouragement from God in the form of overhearing a dream that predicts he's going to defeat the Midianite army, and he sets up his surprise attack on the enemy encampment in the middle of the night. The 300 men sneak around the campsite and then reveal themselves all at once by smashing these pots that they'd brought, which had uh, burning torches hidden inside them and blowing on trumpets. God gives them a miraculous victory. The Midianites all start fighting against one another before they flee. And Gideon definitely doesn't appear to be the per kind of person you'd first think of to lead an army. Uh, but God chooses, God chooses him and is willing to support and build his confidence to carry out God's will. Finally, for our last example, uh, we'll compare the people of Israel's choice for a king to God's choice. Uh, skipping through 1 Samuel 8, we read that Samuel is old and Samuel's sons have a reputation for being dishonest and taking bribes. And as such, they aren't suitable to take over his position as judge over Israel. The elders of Israel therefore come to Samuel and ask him to make them a king to rule over them, to judge them and to fight battles for them like all the other nations around them had. Samuel consults with God, warns the people of what they're getting into, uh, and then agrees in the end to give them what they want. And moving to chapter 9 of First Samuel then, we'll read a f just a few verses. First uh, Samuel 9 verses 1 to 2. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bechorath, son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Thank you. Uh, so the first king uh, that Israel gets is in keeping with their desire to have a king like the nations around them had. Saul's from a important and a powerful family, and he's both physically attractive and physically imposing. However, unfortunately, his character leaves much to be desired. After Samuel anoints him, Saul goes back home and seems to want to just live life as normal, not even telling anyone that he's been anointed, even though, like Gideon as well, he was also given a miraculous sign to prove to him that God's with him. When Samuel then gathers the people together to crown him king, he's hiding out in the, the, the supplies and the equipment that's been brought for the occasion and needs to be found before the coronation can, be take, can like, take place. Uh, and even after he's officially recognized, he still goes back home, 
and it takes a Ammonite invasion in the following chapter to get him to take any sort of leadership action. He gathers the people and defends the town of Jabesh Gilead and routes the enemy camp, which, if I uh, understand correctly, is also a night attack, which parallels nicely to this, the story of Gideon. And finally, we we're getting somewhere, you might think. He's taking some leadership action and doing things that are somewhat righteous. He even seems to make the virtuous decision of controlling the situation after the Ammonite innovation is defeated uh, because the Israelites want to go after some people who had refused to accept him as king earlier. And he instead says, no, no one should be killed. Uh, God's given Israel a victory. And so everyone goes to Gilgal. His position is re-established. Uh, offerings are offered and everyone seems happy. Unfortunately, it's only two years later when things go off the rails. The Philistines, uh, one of the other Ains, uh, the, the Philistines bring a massive army to fight Israel and Saul, Saul intends to go to fight against them. He waits seven days for Samuel to show up in order to offer an offering to God, but his army is starting to, to disintegrate around him for fear of the Philistine army, and he decides he'll have to make the sacrifice himself in case the Philistines attack. And then they would be in the position of having to fight without having made this offering to God for the best chance of success in the coming battle. As soon as he's gone ahead and, and done so, however, Samuel shows up and tells him that his lineage could have ruled Israel forever, but because of his disobedience in offering the sacrifice himself rather than trusting in God and continuing to wait for Samuel to show up, this would no longer be the case. Somewhat later on, uh, Saul receives a message from God via Samuel saying that Saul is to attack Amalek, acting as God's instrument in enacting divine retribution, as the, Am the Amalekites had previously been responsible for raiding the children of Israel while they were coming out of, up out of the land of Egypt. And in doing so, he is supposed to kill everything he finds, both people and animals. Well, I can't prove this, but it may well have been that this could have been a test for Saul, and if he had passed it, then perhaps some sort of reconciliation could have happened. But as I said, that's just a, a, a side thought. I can't actually prove it. Regardless, uh, he fails again by looting, or at least permitting the looting by his men, of various goods and the best quality livestock. And in doing so, he doesn't honour his divinely appointed role. He uses it as an opportunity for material gain. It's of particular note that when Samuel pulls him up on this, Saul's response is rather telling. He now refers to God as Samuel's God, not necessarily his own. And as a result of this second rejection of God's commandment, God rejects him from being king over Israel. God's choice for a king comes in chapter 16. Grab this one, First uh, Samuel 16, verse 1. We'll start at. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing as I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. So it was when they came, he looked at Eliab, which is one of Jesse's sons, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or his, at his physical stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he, this being David now, was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel goes to anoint one of the sons of Jesse without being actually told which son it is. 
and at least one of the possible choices being Eliab is once again physically imposing like Saul was and Samuel thinks that clearly Eliab must be uh, the man for the job but God tells him he isn't. God's chosen king is the youngest of the brothers and isn't even there at the start because he's off caring for the sheep and this is a job that was often given to the youngest child in the family because it was considered of relatively low importance and required little physical strength compared to working in the fields for instance. And so we're told that David was physically attractive and later a courageous warrior, articulate in speech, and an accomplished musician, writing the Psalms, of course, but none of these were the trait that made him suitable to be God's chosen king. What, David, what David's trait of choice was for God was his character. David had great faith and put his trust in God even from a young age. And there are, there are many places we could go to see this happening, uh, but it's first recorded in his face-off against Eliah, uh, Goliath. His father, Jesse, sends him off on a supply run to give his brothers in the army various provisions, and when he arrives, he hears Goliath challenging the Israelite army. He takes exception to this, uh, gets, in, uh, gets called in to meet Saul, and uh, he refuses the armor that Saul's got and the, the weapons and so on, citing that he's, he's not used to them, and his trust in God has previously seen him through safeguarding the sheep that he's responsible for against lions and bears, uh, and so he goes down to trust to demonstrate this trust again by fighting the Philistine champion armed only as a shepherd, uh, despite got Goliath being in full armor uh, and having multiple weapons described in a size appropriate for Goliath, which is to say fearsomely oversized for everyone else. His faith and trust in God also extended to keeping God's commandments despite great risk to himself. While he was being attacked and hunted by Saul like he was an outlaw later on, uh, he never directly attacks back and you might recall the occasion when Saul basically delivers himself to David on a platter, and this actually happens more than once, uh, in, in the cave, and then while they're all sleeping and they sneak up and steal uh, the spear and so on. Uh, and every time this happens, David refuses to harm Saul because Saul is still God's anointed king. So despite some recorded failings in life and... The other examples, apart from Jesus that we've got here, all had some failings. G David's character was much more in sync with what God wanted in a king to rule over his chosen people than Saul's, and that's why God chose him. The outward appearance that the people cared about didn't figure into the picture. There are, there, there are many examples in scripture uh, that we could go to to continue looking at this kind of thing. But just from these three examples we've gone over, you can see a number of choices God makes appear to be counterintuitive in the context of the time. Uh, and God's decision making, however, despite this counterintuitive nature, it is always consistent. And with the benefit of hindsight and the explanation that we're provided in scripture, the logic does become apparent. As humans, we have a natural inclination to respect the outward appearance of others and to focus on maintaining our own, to show to uh, people around us that we're confident in our own abilities uh, and that we want to be leaders, to look down on those who have or take on what we perceive to be roles of lesser importance. But as disciples, our primary focus should be inward. We should look past external trappings and we're told to instead value and work on improving our own characters to trust in god where we know ourselves to be inadequate in our own ability and to take on roles which while they may be seen as of lesser importance to others are vital to the proper functioning of the ecclesia and finally while we can't predict what role we will have in god's coming kingdom Desiring the spiritual and physical welfare of others, instead of trying to build up a position for ourselves, is our best bet for getting there. In the words of Psalm 84, a single day in God's courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So, I'd like to end by posing a question as food for thought. 
Uh, what de decisions do you personally make as a result of being a disciple of Christ that people outside the faith might not understand? And would you be able to explain why you do what you do if someone asked? Thank you. Thank you.